Hi folks, and welcome once again to Defense of the Faith Ministries. We're completing a five-part series on the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement. And in the first four uh, modules, we've been talking about the sort of flagship phenomenon of this movement, which is the tongues speaking, both public and private. In this final part, part five, we're going to go over ten additional reasons why defense of the faith ministries cannot support the Pentecostal charismatic movement. We're going to list them laundry style first, uh, and then we're going to go back to each one of them and give a brief uh, definition of what we're talking about. We're not going to be able to go in, in, into the kind of detail that I would like to do because today's module is going to be a little bit longer than our normal one. We have some exciting information to pass on to you at the end of our presentation, so we encourage you to stay with us uh, for the entire thing. All right, let's start this list off then. The first one, the first reason, additionally beyond the tongue speaking, would be the false doctrine of an end times latter rain miracle revival. The second would be the false doctrine of a personal Pentecost. Number three, the false doctrine about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And number four, the false doctrine about a baptism, a baptism of fire. Number five, the false emphasis placed on the Holy Spirit. And number six, the false doctrine about women in the ministry, specifically as pastors. And false doctrine, read number seven, the false doctrine is that the healing, the physical healing, is in the atonement. Number eight, the false doctrine that a born-again Christian can actually lose his salvation. And number nine, the false doctrine that miracles are required to produce faith. And finally, we'll wrap it up with number ten, the false ecumenical movement. And again, on each of these, we could spend much longer than we are going to be able to because of the time constraint today. Well, number one, the false doctrine then about the end time, latter rain, miracle, revival. Pentecostals and Charismatics have taught that the Lord's coming will be preceded by a worldwide revival of signs and wonders. Well, folks, what does the Bible say about this? In Acts 2, 17 through 21, Peter says that the Joel prophecy was fulfilled in his day with the events of Pentecost. Now, there are two parts to that prophecy that Peter cited. The first part would be the prophesying itself, and the second part, the signs and wonders in the heavens. Peter tells us that in this passage the prophesying was fulfilled in his day at the beginning of the church age, 1 Corinthians 14, 20-22. We also know from scripture that the last half of Joel's prophecy will be fulfilled at the Lord's coming. Now this would include the heavenly signs um, that are described in Revelation. And they won't happen until the tribulation and the return of Christ. Well, the entire rest of the New Testament describes only apostasy and false miracles at the end of the church age. Matthew 24, 24, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 10, and several other passages uh, emphasize this apostasy and false doctrine. Number two, the number two point why we can't support the Pentecostal movement would be the false doctrine about a personal Pentecost. Now, another false doctrine is this experience of Pentecost, which is described in Acts chapter 2. And Pentecostals feel that it's something to be sought after and experienced by every Christian. William Seymour of the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles invited his audience, and I'll quote him, to get your personal Pentecost and the baptism with the Holy Ghost and fire, unquote. Well, what does the Bible say? 
Pentecost is actually the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in the feasts, Leviticus 23. We're going to give you three points to emphasize this. The first feast, point number one, the first feast was the Passover and the associated unleavened bread, Leviticus 23, 5 through 8. Now this depicted Christ's death on the cross. Point number two, the next feast would be the first fruits, Leviticus 23, 10 through 14. And this depicted Christ's resurrection as the first fruits from the dead. And third, the third major point would be 50 days after was the Feast of Pentecost, and that's found in Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 21. And this depicted the coming of the Holy Spirit to oversee the harvest. Well, this typology, folks, was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. All of these were fulfilled at one time and completed events that were not repeated, but had an abiding consequence. Well, Christians are never told to seek a Pentecost experience. The believer is sealed with the Spirit of God when he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 12, and 13. Nowhere in the epistles are God's people instructed to seek a Pentecost, or to seek the Holy Spirit, or to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When Pentecostals pray for a new Pentecost and demand that God give them an experience like that of Pentecost, they're praying contrary to the scriptures, Romans 10, 17. God acts according to his own sovereign word. And to pray for something which the Bible doesn't promise is presumption. And that, folks, is a sin. The Bible says this in uh, Isaiah 8.20, To the law and to the testimony, if they believe not these words, it is because there is no light in them. Now, the Bible is our sole authority for all things having to do with faith and practice. Well, number three, the false doctrine about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. From the beginning, most Pentecostal denominations have taught that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience that must be sought subsequent or after salvation and that it's accompanied by tongue speaking as the evidence of that baptism. Well, what does the Bible say about this? And it has plenty to say. Jesus promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 verse 5, and this was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. There was actually a threefold reception of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, for the Jews, it was in Acts 2. For the Samaritans, Acts 8, 14 through 17. And for the Gentiles, Acts 10, verses 44 through 47. Well, then some might say, well, what about Acts 19, verses 1 through 7? Well, if we look at these passages, it's obvious from Paul's question that it was common for the Holy Spirit to be given to believers, and that's found in verse 2. This is contrary to the common Pentecostal belief. Additionally, these men in Acts 19, 1 through 7, had not believed the gospel, but they had only believed in a corrupted, perverted version of John the Baptist's message. We believe this because John preached salvation through Jesus Christ, and that's found in John 1, 29. But these men didn't understand salvation, knowing only the ritual of baptism, but without the significance, even in that ritual. Additionally, John preached the coming of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 3, verse 11. But these men didn't know about the Holy Spirit, 
Also, the laying on of hands was by an apostle, verse 6. Finally, the situation we find in Acts 19 was unique, and it's not a pattern for the rest of the church age or for believers today. Remember, the book of Acts was a book of history and a transition book from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the law to grace. Well, the book of Acts, again, is transitional, and not everything that really happened in this book is a pattern for the continuing church age. The Bible warns that there are false spirits given by Satan and made to imitate the Holy Spirit. And we need to be very careful about seeking something that the Bible doesn't say we should seek. And that's 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 makes it abundantly clear that tongues is not the evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 says this, All, all, all have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. But, verse 30 says this, that not all speak in tongues. So there it is, in two verses, folks. Everyone is baptized who believes, but not everyone speaks in tongues. Well, number four, the false doctrine about the baptism of fire. <clears throat> The Pentecostal movement <clears throat> excuse me, has taught a baptism of fire from its very inception. Some Pentecostal groups even have named themselves fire-baptized Holy Ghost people. Well, the charismatic movement still holds to a remnant of this idea. Roman Catholic Ralph Martin's book, for example, published in 1976, was entitled, Fire on the Earth. Finally, the Laughing Revival has accepted this precept since its inception. The Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship still hosts an annual Catch the Fire conference each year. Remember, it was this fellowship, this church, where the Laughing Revival began. Well, what does the Bible say? Matthew 3.11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, verse 12 says the baptizing or the baptism with fire is God's judgment on unbelievers. In other verses, the same is taught. Isaiah 66, verse 15, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 11, and the Revelation chapters 19 and 20. All of these deal with that issue. Well, how about the false emphasis then on the Holy Spirit? Number five. The Pentecostal charismatic movement places an unbiblical emphasis upon the Holy Spirit. Benny Hinn, for example, his book, Good Morning Holy Spirit, is an example. Hinn prays to the Holy Spirit. Hinn seeks the Holy Spirit. And Hinn invites the Holy Spirit. Well, what does the Bible say? The Lord Jesus Christ foretold what role the Holy Spirit would have in the church age. And this is found in John 16, 13 through 15. In this passage, we learn that the Holy Spirit doesn't exalt himself and doesn't draw attention to himself. This is there is absolutely no example in the entire New Testament of praying to the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ taught us how to pray and it was to the Father, not to the Holy Spirit. And that's Matthew 6, verse 6, John 16, 23. Christ's own prayers were always...